Hi, it's Jason Gorman here from Codemanship um, with the third in my series on test-driven development for JavaScript programmers. If you missed the first two videos, I highly recommend you take a look at those first. Um, there'll be links in the description below. And um, in this third video, I'm going to be thinking about um, how do we know what tests we need to write? What unit tests should we actually write? And it's a question that comes up a lot particularly with people who are new to test-driven development. Now, there's a myth about TDD, um, quite a damaging myth, that you, you're not supposed to do any thinking about the design up front. This has never been seriously recommended by anybody. Um, it is a good idea to have a, a think, a quick think about the design. Um, and I'm going to be looking at a, a technique that's described in Kent Beck's book, Test-Driven Development by Example, called a test list. A test list is literally just a list of test cases. So we're given a requirement like this, for example, we might want to think about, okay, what, what test cases might the software need to handle in order to satisfy this, this requirement, in order to implement these features. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to break down this requirement into its component features, if you like, um, and then we're going to look at each feature and ask what test cases might we need to handle in the software. So let's start with the, the, the most important one, arguably, which is buying a CD. So customers can buy a CD, okay? Now, I could think of two potential outcomes for trying to buy a CD. There's the happy path, which is that the CD is in stock. We've got enough copies of it for that customer's purchase. But what if we don't? What if there's insufficient stock? So for buying a CD, there's a couple of tests we might need to write. Um, now, we can also search for a CD, and let's keep this really, really simple. We could, of course, make it a lot more sophisticated, but let's assume that CDs are uniquely identified by artist and title, and that each artist and title in our catalog is unique. Um, we've, only got, we've, either got, we've either got it or we haven't, so that's nice and easy. We've either got that artist and title or we haven't. Okay, so it's either in the catalog or it's not in the catalog, in which case we'll produce some different result. Okay. And then finally, receiving batches of CDs from a label. Well, um, let's think of the simplest case. This one's going to be slightly more complex than the others. What would be the simplest case we can think of? Well, we receive um, one copy of one CD that's already in the catalog. So we're not adding it to the catalogue, we've already got copies of it. Okay, and what about multiple copies that are also in the catalogue? Okay, what if it's not in the catalogue? So we're not just adding the stock of a CD, we're actually adding the CD to the catalogue. And then finally, what if there's more than one CD in the batch? So 10 copies of one CD and 20 copies of another CD from the same label. So if we were to say multiple titles. Okay, so there's a bunch of test cases we might need to pass. Um, and we've had a little think now that that process of going through and enumerating those test cases forces us to think about the design, um, but not in a prescriptive way. We're not saying this is how the software will, will, will handle these particular features, these particular test cases, but we're saying it will need to handle them. So we're thinking at that kind of level. Now, once we've done that, <clears throat> particularly at the beginning of a project, when, when the design's kind of a bit muddy and a bit vague, it can be useful. And again, this is totally allowable. There's no rule that says you can't do this in, in test room development or agile software development. It's totally um, fine to sit down and maybe sketch a diagram. For example, here I've sketched out a class diagram um, that is what I think at this point, before I've written any code, remember, before I've written any code, I think, well, maybe this is kind of sort of what it's going to end up looking like. And we've got this warehouse and it's got a catalogue and there are CDs in the catalogue and we can search the catalogue, we can buy a CD, we can check the stock count. So when we bought a CD, we can see what's happened to that. Um, and each CD will have multiple stock items in the warehouse and so on and so forth. So we've had a bit of a think based on our analysis there, based on our test list about what the design might look like. So now we're in a pretty good position to start writing unit tests. Um, but we need to be a little careful here with upfront design when we plan a design like this. 
what a lot of people who are new to TDD tend to fall into the trap of doing is they start to write their tests based not on the list of cases that the software has to handle, not based on the test cases, but based on the actual internal implementation design. So an inexperienced TDD programmer might look at the CD class and go, well, let's start with the stock count. Let's write a, a unit test for checking stock count. Now, here's the thing. The only reason that I think I need the ability to check the stock count is so that I can test whether buying a CD has worked. It's a consequence of passing that test. It's not a feature in its own right. It's something in the design that supports a feature. Now, remember TDD, Test Driven Development, is a design process that is all about discovering what would be the simplest design that would pass our tests. So let's not drive it the wrong way around. Let's not start with the design and then just think, well, I need to write a test for all of these methods in my design. Um, because that's that's the cart leading the horse. Um, you want to have the, the other way around. The test should be determining what is required. So if we were going to write a test for buying a CD, which is a useful piece of behavior rather than an internal design detail. Um, let's do that. Let's create a test for that. So these, this is going to be a test for our CD. Okay, and what we're going to do is we're going to uh, buy a CD. And it's going to be when it's in stock. It um, removes quantity bought from stock count. Okay. Now, if you watch the first two videos, in the second video you will have noticed that I was writing my test assertion first and working backwards to the setup. So we ask the question we want to ask and work our way backwards. So let's write an assertion for this. I'll need to import that assert, something I'm always forgetting to do. Okay, so we're good to go. So working backwards in that way. So I, if I reference something and then I declare it, in my code. Okay, so we imagine we have a CD. So what we're, what we're imagining is we have a, a getter for stock count, but the only reason we need it is for this particular test. The test is telling us you need this. So let's imagine we're buying one copy of a CD and we'll, uh, we should end up at the end of that with no copies, should be out of stock. So we work our way backwards from here and Let's go uh, old school here. Um, so let's make it a, a JSON object. And at the moment, now in my original design, I went a bit, I went a bit fancy, and I had a, a stock item object and so on and so forth. But in actual fact, I'm not sure I really need individual objects for stock items. I think I just need a stock count. Okay, so let's make that one which case we probably don't need this either if we're going good old functional um, so the cd has a stock count we don't need to know what the artist and title are it's in our design but we don't need it yet remember we're test driven we're only doing what we need for the test so any details in our design like our object needs a stock count is determined by well that's what we need in order to ask this question okay and then let's buy the cd and let's buy a quantity of one. Okay, let's create that function. There. And let's make that a bit more descriptive. Okay. And uh, if it's functional, then we should probably Do it the functional way. Okay, now what I want to do is I want to run this test and make sure that it does fail when the quantity at the end is wrong, when the stock count is wrong. 
So see your test fail. Let's run that. Okay, now what it's saying is, is that nothing's being returned. So this test assertion isn't failing. It's not failing because it's the wrong stock count. It's failing because of uh, an unhandled um, uh, reference exception there. So let's just for now see it fail for the right reasons. Let's see it fail because the stock count is wrong. There we go. Okay, so now we know this is a good test. If it doesn't change the stock count by the right amount, then um, it's not going to work. Now, in order to pass this test, we could take teeny tiny steps, um, as we've done in, in previous examples, but I actually think that the implementation of this is ob uh, pretty obvious, really. Um, so we're just going to do the obvious implementation. Obvious implementation is another of the patterns in Kent's book. If you can see that the implementation to pass this test is easy, then just do it. Don't take little steps, just do it. Um, so we're going to do that, and um, what we're going to do is we're going to make a copy of our CD, and we're just going to change the stock count. So the easy way would be just go, oh well, let's just make the stock count one. But I actually think that doing the do, doing the actual behaviour that we want is going to be not that much more complicated. Count minus one like that, uh, so minus quantity. So it's trivial, it's obvious. So let's just do the obvious thing. And now our test is passing. I don't need those parentheses, so we can get rid of those. So now our test is passing in the obvious way. and We've implemented that first piece of behavior. And then what we would do is we would go to our test list and we would tick that one off. We'd say, okay, that one's done, and move on to the next test case in our list. So we're working through the list one at a time, crossing out each test that we're passing. So it provides a kind of a roadmap. Now, as we implement more and more of these features, we may think of more test cases, and that's fine. Um, remember, the map is not the terrain. Um, so we simply add that new test case to our list. So we can, we stay focused on the test that we're working on. But if we're looking at that and thinking, ah, but what if this happens? Um, then rather than get distracted by that, we just say, well, let's just add that to the list. And that gives us a sort of a rough idea of, of how well we're doing in terms of progress. So I'm a big fan of test lists um, for two reasons. One, because they tend to focus my mind on what does the code need to do? Not what is the design that I want, but what does the code need to do? Um, and then let the design fall out of that. And also I like them because when I'm working through the day, they give me a good kind of roadmap of progress. It's when people say, well, how long do you think it's going to take you now? Well, I'm halfway through my test list, so I guess I'm half done. So they're a nice way of kind of managing your time and, 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 and working through things. Um, so a bit like a task list, but better than a task list because it's actual features, it's actual behavior, it's, it's delivered working software. So you're ticking off, okay, it does this now, it does this now, it does this now, it does this one now. So there's three things we've looked at in this particular video. The first thing we looked at is how we can use a test list to help us think about the design up front, but in, think about it in terms of um, useful behavior, things that the customer wants to do, rather than thinking in terms of a detailed internal design. Um, we looked at how um, we can uh, use a test list to drive our development um, in terms of sort of planning how we're going to work through it. So it is a useful kind of aid in that respect. Um, and we've also seen how um, the the details of the design are best left to the, 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 the test-driven process itself. So either while we're writing the test, we think, oh, well, I'm going to need a function that does that. Or... Um, after when we're refactoring thinking well those three things are the same so maybe that should all be in its own function now um, so let let the test driven design process take care of the details of the implementation don't think too much about detail think about end results okay so um, another video will be coming later this week hope that's been useful um, I'm Jason Gorman um, until the next one